G'day guys, how you going? Uh, welcome to this next video. This one's going to be a bit bigger than usual. This one's sort of a mega video where I'm going to go through AQA, GCSE, Biology, Foundation level, um, and I'm going to literally cover it, all three major components, inheritance, variation, and evolution, ecology, and then finally with the homeostasis unit. Uh, and being in mind, that, bearing in mind that this is biology, uh, and that is indeed a frog, let's hop right into it. And we're going to start with inheritance, variation, and evolution initially. Uh, and so the first thing we need to understand about for foundation biology is DNA. Uh, and so what DNA is, is it actually is this sort of structure here that you can see in the background there. It's this sort of twisted ladder, which is what we call a double helix. That's sort of the fancy name for the structure of DNA. And that's what we want you to write down. If they ask you the structure of DNA, double helix. It is also the instructions that we use to build proteins in the body, okay? And it is contained within the nucleus of a cell. And of course, this part is the nucleus just here, all right? DNA stand also stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, which is a fun one to drop at parties. Uh, so DNA, double helix structure, instructions for building protein, and it's contained within the nucleus of the cell. Major three things that you need to know about DNA. Okay, so let's look about inheritance then. Well, what, what do we do when we pass this DNA on? Uh, and before we start that, I want you to have a look at this key term just here. So if I had a small section of DNA which coded for a particular protein, it's what we call an allele, okay? And these alleles can be passed from parent to their offspring. And we use Punnett squares to work out what the offspring would look like. So we could, we could um, take two peas and breed them together and look what the offspring might look like. We could predict offspring of certain parents based on eye color, hair color, and things like that. And that's what we need to be able to do as part of it. And to do it, we do this Punnett square. And I'm going to try and step it out as simply as I possibly can with just the mechanics of what you need to be able to do. Step one is draw your Punnett square, okay? And it's a little bit like a hashtag or like you're playing noughts and crosses, all right? That's what you need to start drawing, okay? Step two is work out the parents' genes. What genes did the parents actually have or what what alleles did the parents actually have? Uh, and that, that'll be given to you in the question, okay? So for example, we've got dad here who has blue eyes, which is a lowercase allele, uh, a recessive allele, recessive allele, okay? Which is what those two lowercase b's are for, for blue eyes. Uh, Mum actually has brown eyes, but she's what we describe as heterozygous. She has the dominant brown eye allele and the recessive blue eye allele. Now, if you're getting a bit thrown by homozygous, heterozygous, uh, dominant, dominant, recessive. I've, we've actually made a video on these inheritance key terms and I encourage you to go have a look at the inheritance variation evolution evolution key terms video because it will cover all these things that I'm using in a bit more detail, okay? So how do we do this Punnett square then, right? So we then need to put these parent alleles into the Punnett square. And so we take mum and we spread it and we put those two alleles into the Punnett square just like that. And we take dad's alleles and we spread them out and we put them into the Punnett square just like this. And then all you need to do is read down the column and put whatever's in this top box into each of these. So we take that, uh, so we work out the offspring, we take that and we put dominant alleles into each of these. And then we read down in this column and we take, all right, we've got a recessive blue eye allele. So we put that all the way down. And then we go, all right, well, what, what allele are the, the offspring going to inherit from dad? So they're going to inherit this recessive blue eye allele. So we bring that across, we move it across, uh, and then we do it again over here. Recessive blue eye allele just here. And this box in the middle here is actually what our offspring would be. We've got a, a big B, a little b, we've got a big B, little b, we've got a little b, little b, little b, little b. So these two individuals here would have brown eyes because they've got the big dominant b allele. Whereas these two individuals would have blue eyes because they're homozygous recessive or they've only inherited the blue eye allele here. And if you look at these offspring, there's one, two, three, four of them, yeah? Two from four or 50% would have brown eyes and 50% would have blue eyes, okay? And so we can predict what eye color the offspring will have based on these Punnett squares. And that's the basics of how we use them, okay? All right, next. So let's have a look at mitosis and meiosis. And you just need to be able to do some simple comparisons for what they're used for, where they occur, uh, and what, what, what uh, genes are present in the daughter cells, okay? So mitosis, what's it used for? Uh, 
Uh, it is used for growth and repair. Literally, from the moment you are born, you start to die. Cells in your body start to die off, and we need to be able to replace them, okay, so that we don't die, right? Um, whereas meiosis is actually used to make sperms and eggs, sperm and egg cells, or gametes, okay? So meiosis is used for reproduction. Mitosis occurs in all body cells all over your body, whereas meiosis only occurs in the testes or the ovaries or the gonads, which is another fun word that you can use for that. Um, in mitosis, the daughter cells will be identical to the parent. You're just basically taking one cell and splitting it into two identical cells. Whereas in meiosis, what you'll have is you'll have non-identical or different daughter cells. And you'll actually have four of them in meiosis, where you'll only have two of them in, meios in mitosis. Because in meiosis, split and then split again to get four non-identical daughter cells. Um, in mitosis, as we said, they're identical, so they'll have exactly the same genes as the parent, or they'll have 100% of the genetic material. Where in meiosis, what happens is they actually have half the genetic material of the parent, okay? So if we have a sperm with half the genetic material of a parent and an egg with half the genetic material of a parent, when we combine them, we get 100%, or we get enough genes to, to make us, right? Which is what reproduction is all about. It gets us diversity, and it's wonderful. But that is mitosis, and that is meiosis, okay? And you need to be able to do those sort of four comparisons there. All right, so then what about evolution? So evolution is actually this gradual change in organisms over time. It's literally where one organism will slowly transition into a, a new organism at a certain point. And in, in 1859, Charles Darwin actually published a mechanism for evolution, which is called evolution through natural selection. And that's what we're going to need to understand. Natural selection, and then more recently, selective breeding, which we'll come to as well. Um, so we use fossils as evidence evidence for evolution because we can see what organisms used to exist on the planet Earth, compare them to modern living organisms or organisms that other organisms that also used to be alive, and we can sort of figure out how similar they are and where they fit in time, in the time frame of the planet. And so we can work out how some things have changed over time. So we use fossils as evidence for evolution to see what used to be alive. All right, so natural selection. Natural selection made easy. Always, if you get a question on natural selection, do these four things. There's variation. Some individuals are better suited to their environment than others. Therefore, the individuals that are better suited are the ones that survive and reproduce. Therefore, the beneficial characteristics get passed on to their offspring. Okay, And those are the four steps that you always need to do for natural selection. So let's put, and you just need to be able to put it in different contexts. So let's have a look. Here we go. So example. There's variation. We have a, a species and some necks are longer than others, all right? So some are better suited to their environment. So let's have a look at this example. So some, because some necks are longer, they can reach extra food in times of food shortage. So if there's a drought and all the grass disappears or something like that, these individuals with the longer necks will be able to reach higher in the tree and get more food. Because these animals can reach higher in the tree, they can actually survive more. And because they can survive more, they can also reproduce more. And so they have more offspring, right? And then lastly, this means the gene for longer necks get passed on again and again and again. And over millions of generations, over generation after generation after generation, you'll get gradual change over time or evolution. So you just need to be able to do those four steps in various different contexts of whatever the question gives you, okay? All right, so that's natural selection. Let's look at selective breeding, which is kind of how humans have changed natural selection in certain species. You'll notice it's still a very similar four steps, except for the two in the middle are kind of humans did it, right? There's not too much more complicated than that. So step one, there's variation. Step two, humans pick the trait that they want. We want a short nose. We want a cow that produces more milk. We pick what we want, right? And then we force, effectively, these individuals to breed together and therefore over many generations we pass these characteristics along so we're kind of manipulating natural selection 
So for example, some dogs have shorter noses than others, and for whatever reason, we decide that we want dogs with really short noses, despite them um, struggling to survive, uh, because we think they're cute, right, for aesthetic reasons. So we pick the smallest nosed individuals. We take two dogs with the shortest possible noses that we can find, right, and we breed these individuals together. So we put these individuals together so that they can only breed with each other. And then they have babies, and then in the next generation, we select the shortest nosed individuals from the next generation and we breed them together okay and then over many many generations as we repeat this over and over again the snout length or nose length of these dogs is going to get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter until you get things like your pugs you get things like your bulldogs which have really really short noses okay and this is selective breeding and how it occurs all right so next classification um, so classification is fairly simple. We do need to remember some terms, but it's just memory work and it's just practice here. So you need to remember this order of classification. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Okay, to try and help you out, you have many different acronyms and I encourage you to, to Google them. This is just one that Mr. Watkins came up with in high school, right? Kindly put cat out for good something. And we all know what the something is if it begins with an S, but of course I can't say it. Uh, and so this is how I remember the order. This is what I work. Whatever works for you, please do. I also encourage you to look at the classification wrap. I won't do it here because it's way too embarrassing, um, but it's it's a good one to try and help you get into this, this, this sort of naming or classification of organisms. Um, so this is the, the order in which we classify, and it allows us to classify all living things on the planet Earth. Um, we classify to make them easier to study, all right, and then we also name them, which is this next part just here. So if you look at the species name, you'll notice it's made of two parts. So this fox here, or the red fox, is Vulpus vulpus. This is what's called, because the name is made up of two parts, it's what's called a binomial naming system, which is why it's a bicycle, because it's got two wheels. Binomial, two name, is what it's trying to say there. And it's always genus than species. So if we ever give the binomial naming, it's always the genus and then the species is the second name there, which is Vulpus vulpus. In humans, it's our species name is Homo sapiens because we're in the genus Homo and in the species sapiens. So Homo sapiens is effectively uh, our name, right? And so this is useful because it's universal, can be used in any language in the planet and they'll understand it, all right? And it also gives us a little bit of information about the ancestry of that organism. Uh, and this is classification and naming just there. Okay, guys? All right, and that's inheritance, variation, and evolution. Good job for sticking with me so far. Let's try and do a little bit of ecology now. And I am trying to move along so that this doesn't take a million hours, but let's do it. Um, ecology is really important, particularly now. Our planet's in a lot of trouble. Uh, humans are doing lots of really harmful things to our planet, and we need to understand it in order to make it better, right? Um, and in terms of looking f forwards into our future, if we don't do anything about it, we're in a lot of trouble, guys. All right, so let's start with this part here and you can see this beautiful ecosystem here we've got a farm in the background we've got some water we've got some trees this is sort of a typical ecosystem that you might see uh, and what an ecosystem is is actually one of these key terms that we need to know it's a community of interacting organisms and their non-living surroundings so you can see a whole lot of organisms here right you can see all of these different organisms and you can see that they're surrounded by things that are also non-living right things like the water things like the air, things like the minerals in the soil, all of these are non-living, which brings us to our next two terms that you need to be familiar with. So a biotic factor is a living factor. If it's something that is alive, it is biotic. If it's something that is non, a non-living factor is actually an abiotic factor. So abiotic means non-living, Biotic means living. So let's just practice that. Let's throw this out. Okay, so biotic factors. So we're looking for some living factors or living things, right? So humans, that's a biotic factor. This tree is a plant. It's a living thing. It's biotic. These cows are biotic. Um, these various different fish. Uh, this otter over here is biotic. Uh, turtles, biotic. Um, deer over here, biotic. I think they're fowl over there, biotic. All of these things are living, okay? This grass is a living thing, so it's a 
biotic factor. The one that's often people struggle with, you're really good at identifying biotic factors like that, right? Abiotic factors are often a little bit harder to see and they're often what students struggle with. So let's try and find some abiotic factors or non-living factors. And if you want to pause and have a look around and jot them down, please do. So abiotic, non-living thing, we've got water. Okay, it's non-living, but it's important to the survival of these or of this ecosystem. Um, you've got minerals in the soil, right, which help keep these plants alive. That's an important abiotic factor. You've got sunlight, which also helps these plant or allows these plants to photosynthesize, right, and that's an abiotic factor. You've got the temperature. You've got the oxygen concentration in in the air. You've got the carbon dioxide concentration. All of these things that are harder to see are abiotic but they're important to the survival of these ecosystems. So please, when you're asked to talk about the ecosystem, make sure you're talking about biotic and abiotic factors, okay? All right, food chains. So this is probably one of the, the, the best ones to grasp here. Uh, what we've got here is a typical food chain. We've got a plant here, all right, which is a producer, which means it makes its own food, okay? And then we've got this uh, sparrow, let's call it, that eats this plant. Uh, and what that is, is that's actually a consumer because it has to eat another organism to survive. And then we've got this hawk here who's going to eat this sparrow, and that's gonna be our secondary consumer. And this is a food chain. You can see, that the literally uh, this sparrow eats the plant, this hawk eats the bird or the sparrow, right? Okay, and it, the, the energy will flow from the plant into this sparrow into this hawk, right? As things eat other things. Uh, and this is the no terminology that we use. Producers make their own food. Consumers have to eat another organism to get their nutrients. Um, and all food chains start with a producer because all producers do is they actually trap the sun's energy and turn it into glucose or sugars, which ba is the basis of every single food chain and web on the planet, okay? We need plants to survive. If plants die, we die. Die, plain and simple. Um, they are the most important organisms on the planet, right? For us anyway. All right, brilliant. So then what we need to be able to do is think about, well, okay, so if this is a food chain, what if something changes? So let's say an event takes place. For example, for some reason, um, a whole lot of these sparrows have a massive season and they breed a lot. So we've got a massive amount of sparrows now. What is going to happen to this food chain? So you need to think, all right, well, we've got lots of sparrows, which means the hawk has lots and lots of different birds to eat. And so he's got more food, which means what's gonna happen is the hawk numbers are going Going to increase because you can eat lots of food and therefore I can have more babies, right? Is what the hawk's going to be doing. But the fact that there are more sparrows as well, what's going to happen is they're going to eat more of the producers. So the number of the producer or the plant is going to go down. And so you can see that a change in one part of the food chain affects the other parts as well. Because if the primary consumer increases, whatever's behind it, secondary consumer will increase as well because it's got more food but the producer will decrease because it's going to have more organisms eating it, right? And so there's less of it available. And you'll need to be able to talk about that in, in a few different contexts, okay? It's what's called a trophic cascade if you're somewhat inclined. Uh, oops, my picture's disappeared. Let's just ignore that. Um, so food chains, what they actually do is they show the flow of energy through an ecosystem. The energy that was initially trapped by the sun in the producer moves or flows into the consumer's as it moves up the food chain, okay? All right, brilliant. So here we go. Uh, this is a food web, right? And so a food web is a slightly more complicated food chain, basically. Instead of just having one chain, what a food web has is more than one food chain. If you have more than one food chain in an ecosystem, you've got a food web, okay? And we can put these together. And the more complicated the food web, the better, because it means it is more stable. If it's just a simple food chain, it tends to be really unstable. For example, if in the last slide I just showed you, if the plant disappeared, then everything dies. Or if the, haw or if the um, sparrow disappears, all the hawks die, right? Whereas in 
here, if let's say the, the snake disappears, all right, suddenly the snake goes away, all right, yeah, kites are in a bit of a rough situation, but the wild cats are still fine because they can eat the rabbits and the mouse, and they're just the snakes disappearing doesn't really harm the wild cats very much, so the lions aren't harmed. So this whole part of the food web isn't affected by just a small change down here. Whereas in the last slide, if I took away one single organism, the whole thing collapses, okay? Um, and so this is, this is really important. This is food webs. Okay, so let's look at the carbon cycle now, or cycling of material and how carbon moves through the atmosphere. Now this one's a little bit tricky to try and show you how it works. So I'm gonna try and visualize it as much as possible. Um, one thing you'll notice is that we're looking at the flow of carbon through the ecosystem. And you'll notice that I've put a little yellow, I've highlighted the C for the carbon in yellow. So you can always see where that carbon is as it moves around uh, the ecosystem. So at the moment, the carbon is in the atmosphere in carbon dioxide. What can happen to it? Well, it can actually be taken into plants and used for photosynthesis. And what photosynthesis does is it takes that carbon dioxide, reacts it with water with the help of sunlight to make glucose, a sugar. So let's have a look. So there we go. So then now we've got the glucose. We've made this sugar with glucose and you can still see the carbon just there. So what does the plant do with it? Well, the plant may very well use that glucose or that sugar for respiration. So it reacts the glucose with oxygen to release the energy it needs to keep itself alive, which means the carbon is then converted back straight back into carbon dioxide, just like you saw, which is released out of the leaf of the plant and it's back into the atmosphere. So photosynthesis will take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, respiration will release that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. So this is one way or one path that that carbon could have taken. Let's have a look at a different path. So the plant brings the carbon dioxide into it, uses it for photosynthesis to make glucose, right? So there's the carbon, and then it stores it in a fruit or its leaves or something like that. And what actually happens is ingestion, or this cow over here actually eats part of the plant. So the carbon flows from the plant into the cow now, right? And so now we've got this glucose present in the cow. Well, the cow is going to use that for respiration. It is going to use that glucose to release the energy it needs to survive. And it's going to release that carbon dioxide as a waste product straight back into the atmosphere. And what you can see there is the cycle. This repeats itself again and again and again. And this is what the carbon cycle is. That's exactly how it works. And for foundation, these are the core things you need to be able to do. Photosynthesis, respiration, and ingestion. Okay, guys, hope this helps. All right, next part, adaptations. Um, so an adaptation is any characteristic that helps an organism to survive or reproduce. Uh, so for example, let's have a look at this little fella over here. Um, how is he adapted or she adapted to its environment? And you might think, mm, all right, okay. It's got lots of really, excuse me, cat cough in the background. Uh, you've got uh, lots of really fluffy feathers which trap a lot of air, which is like wearing a big puffy coat, right? It helps keep the penguin warm. So yes, it's fluffy down or feathers help keep the penguin warm. It's also got a lot of blubber under there, right? And that fatty layers help keep the penguin warm again because it insulates it. Um, its toes actually have a lot of sort of these fatty pads on the bottom, which help stop its feet from getting too cold. And also one thing you notice about penguins is penguins often huddle together, even when they're little tiny babies. And this adaptation here where the penguins huddle together to help keep each other, is adorable, right? Absolutely adorable. But it also helps keep the penguins warm because they share body heat with each other and they'll cycle around as they go in order to keep themselves nice and warm. Um, so these are all adaptations. The feathers and the feet and the blubber are all structural adaptations. They're things in the body which help keep it warm. Whereas huddling together socially is actually what's called a behavioral adaptation. It's things you do, okay? And these are some examples of adaptations that help keep it alive. All right, uh, so biodiversity then. Biodiversity is actually this next part of the ecology unit. And biodiversity is the variety of different species in a given ecosystem or the earth, right? It's basically the number of different species in a particular ecosystem, in a particular area, okay? If there's lots of different species, that's a high biodiversity. If there's only a few different species, that's a low biodiversity, okay? But there's problems here, right? 
because humans actually tend to harm biodiversity. And how do they do it? We do it through producing waste. The more waste we produce, the more organisms die, basically, and that reduces biodiversity. We do it through land use. When we clear big swathes of lands to build cities or houses or anything, right, we effectively kill or remove habitats, which kills the species within them, which reduces biodiversity. We cut swathes of forest, right? We clear forest for farmland, um, for wood, all of these things mean that we destroy habitats, we reduce biodiversity, or more recently through things like global warming. By releasing a whole lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we warm the planet, which causes things like the ice caps to melt, and so polar bears and excuse me, certain Arctic organisms will actually die off because they don't have an area to survive. So humans, big four, waste, land use, deforestation, and global warming. These are the big four ways that we harm biodiversity. But how do we protect it? It's not all doom and gloom. Humans are trying, or some humans are trying to make a difference, okay? And we do it, and I thought I'd get a bit patriotic here and show you what England does, right? England does breeding programs. So if there's a, a particular species that is dying off, we get them, take them to a zoo, breed them together so we get more, right? Um, we protect habitat. So if there's a certain rare environment, which is habitat for certain organisms, we try and protect it, okay? We try and reduce deforestation as well and by reducing deforestation we reduce destruction of habitats or and this is something that everyone can do every piece of rubbish to try and reduce waste recycle as much as you can because that gets reused and it doesn't end up in the oceans or landfill which is actually killing organisms and reducing biodiversity okay really important stuff but these are the four main ways that we are trying to protect or stop the reduction in biodiversity okay Oh, okay, and that's ecology. So now for our lucky last unit, which is actually homeostasis, which is looking at our body, inside our body, and what happens there, okay? So we'll start with the definition of what is homeostasis. And it is actually keeping the internal conditions of the body constant, even if the outside environment changes. So keeping yourself humming along at about 37 degrees Celsius, if you're as hot as Mr. Watkins, um, at about 37 degrees Celsius, even if it's 14 outside or 10 or 35, or if he's back home, back in Australia, 50 degrees, right? It, my body temperature will still be 37. I'll be sweating a lot, but I'll be 37. Um, and this is regulated by two systems. The nervous system, which is what we're going to start with, and then the endocrine system, which we're going to come to in a bit, all right? So here we go. Uh, nervous system is made up of two parts, the CNS and the PNS. The CNS is the central nervous system. And as you can see from this image, it is your brain and your spinal cord, right? That is the central central part of the nervous nervous system, just the brain, spinal cord, all right? Tick, nailed it. Um, the peripheral nervous system, or the PNS, is basically everything else, all right? Central nervous system, brain, spinal cord, peripheral nervous system is all the other nerves that go to and to and from your central nervous system. So all the nerves that, that go out to your muscles in your hands and allow you to do pretty wonderful things, um, they're all part of the peripheral nervous system. Whereas the brain and the spinal cord, which kind of controls the signals that are coming out of it, okay? And so all of these nerves going to and from the central nervous system um, are peripheral nervous system. The brain and the spinal cord is your central nervous system, okay? All right, uh, so what about receptors then? We thought we'd start, we talked about selective breeding. Here's a prime example of selective breeding. Um, here we go. So what receptors can you see right on this face? And you can pause it and think and do whatever you want and have a look and see if you can pick up the receptors. You know, we'll play some elevator music in the background. Like... <laughs> Anyways, so what do we have? We've got sound receptors, right? Uh, so these sound receptors in the ears are what actually detect noises around us, just like how you are hearing my dulcet tones right now if you are not asleep. You will also see light receptors in the eye, which allows you to see what is on your screen and actually process some of that information there. You'll have taste receptors on your tongue, which allow you to taste the wonderful food that you're eating tonight. Um, and you'll have smell receptors as well, which allows you to smell your environment 
environment around you. Go out and smell some flowers, for example, or something like that. These are all receptors that detect something. And then we need to bring that signal back into our brain to actually process that information. And so once we've done that, that is the first part. That's the receptors, okay? We also have these other things which are called effectors, all right? And we're gonna start with these two um, to sort of get you warmed up. So effectors are things that cause a response, right? Effectors are the things that make the change. For example, effectors can be muscles, which allows you, I send a signal out of my brain and I clamp my hand or my muscle contracts. These are causing an effect. They're causing me to move, right? Really important things. Or they can be glands over here on the right. The effectors could be releasing a hormone, for example, testosterone uh, or estrogen in order to regulate another part of the body. So the receptors are the things that detect the signals and the effectors are the things that cause your body to respond or cause an effect. Effect, all right, so use the language to try and help you. Receptors receive, effectors affect. Okay, so there are three types of neuron that regulate this, and this is sort of the next part before we get into a reflex arc that you need to know. Number one, the things that sense are sensory neurons. So you have some sort of receptor, you have receptors in your skin which detect certain things. And what these sensory neurons, which is this guy just here, is they carry a signal from a receptor in your skin back towards your central nervous system. And that is what sensory neurons do. Take a signal from outside back, sorry, excuse the cat's tail, um, and bring it back towards your sensory, central nervous system. Um, a relay neuron is, is you can actually see the end of the sensory neuron here and the start of the next neuron here, no, no prizes for thinking that a relay neuron actually carries the signal between these two neurons. So it relays the information from the sensory out to the motor neuron just here. So it passes a signal from a sensory to motor neurons in the central nervous system. Um, a motor neuron, you can see the end of the relay neuron just here on the left. What it does is the motor neuron actually carries a signal from the relay neuron to a muscle or a gland, the effector, the thing that's actually gonna cause the change. So this motor neuron here is terminating on some muscle fibers, so it might be able to contract and move that arm or something like that, okay? I wanted to try and create this to try and help you with some of these terms. I know sensory relay and motor neurons are a bit, a bit alien and I wanted to try and use the language to help you, right? So if you think about your senses, straight whoop, senses straight away you were thinking about detecting what is around you sight smell taste all of these things so if it's getting information from the outside and bringing it towards the brain it's a sense it's a sensory neuron okay use the words relay a relay neuron well we think all right well what's a relay race a relay race is when one person passes the baton to another um, so a neuron that passes a signal from one neuron to the next neuron is going to be a relay neuron using the language to help you out. Motor, all right, well a motor in a car causes it to move. So a neuron which causes you to move or respond is going to be a motor neuron, right? Please use the words to try and help you. Sensors, relay and motor to help you determine which neuron is which. So let's put this into practice of what we call a reflex arc, right? Um, these are really important actions. Reflex actions happen automatically. Your brain doesn't have to think about it um, and that allows them to occur much faster in order to keep you alive because you'll notice that the brain's actually not involved at all. It is just the spinal cord, which is why it's a non-conscious action because they do not involve a conscious part of the brain or the signal does not go through the conscious part of the brain, okay? So let's start with it, here we go. You've accidentally put your hand over the counter going, ooh, that's, that's gonna be hot. And the first thing that's gonna detect it is actually the receptors in the skin. So receptors in the skin detect it, oh, this is a really hot candle, and they start sending a signal through this neuron. And if it's to bringing information from the outside in, it is going to be a sensory neuron, right? Um, and so the sensory neuron comes all the way into the spinal cord. And then we've got this yellow neuron here, which is joining a sensory or one neuron to another, which means just like a race, it is going to be our relay neuron. And so you can see the relay neuron in the middle just here, and it joins straight to some sort of neuron, which is 
causing a muscle to move. What was the thing that caused a car, oh, a motor. So a motor caused a car to move. So this must be a motor neuron, okay? And this is what a reflex arc is. It goes, some sort of stimulus like heat um, goes, gets detected by a receptor, sends a signal through a sensory neuron, which comes back to the central nervous system, goes through a relay neuron, to a motor neuron, to an effector, which is a muscle or a gland, and causes you to pull away from that. It's an automatic action. And you will have noticed that if you accidentally put your hand on something, you, you jerk it away really quickly without thinking. And that's because of this reflex arc just here. All right. Okay, so that's the nervous system that we need to know. Let's have a look at the endocrine system. Um, and please pause this video if you want to write these down or anything. Basically, you need to know these glands and you need to know their location, okay? The pituitary gland, which sort of hangs almost like a little punching bag off the bottom of the brain, is, is like a master gland. It controls oh, so many other glands in your body. Our thyroid gland, which sits in your neck, controls things um, like growth. It's really quite important. Uh, adrenals uh, and metabolism for your thyroid. Uh, adrenal glands, they release adrenaline, which is important in that sort of fight or flight response. Uh, your pancreas is involved in blood glucose regulation, which we'll just come to in a bit. Ovaries are involved in the female reproductive hormones and sort of regulating the menstrual cycle. Uh, and your testes are involved in the male reproductive hormone testosterone and regulating things like making sperm and spermatogenesis and stuff like that okay all right so let's go through one of the key parts of the endocrine system we've looked at some glands let's look at how we regulate blood glucose which is the next part that we need to know oh tim tams by the way um so hypothetically you've eaten a whole lot of these lollies or you you've, you're in australia and you've eaten a whole lot of tim tams which are delicious things um you're going to have a lot of sugar in your blood. You need to know how our body brings that back down. And there are five steps to control blood glucose. Step one is if you have a high blood glucose level because you've just eaten a whole lot of sugar, and this is the only context you need to deal with it in foundation, okay? So high blood glucose, all right, the pancreas will detect this and it will release insulin into the bloodstream, okay? Insulin will travel through the blood to the liver. The liver absorbs glucose from the blood and turns it into glycogen because the liver, when it gets the signal from insulin, goes, oh, I need to turn this glucose into glycogen. So it'll absorb the glucose, turn it into this storage molecule called glycogen, which will pull the glucose out of the blood or lower blood glucose, okay? So what is glycogen then? Well, glycogen is made when multiple glucose are stuck together. And this will make a bit more sense to help um, explain the next part here. So let's have a look. So if glucose joins together like does a little loop-de-loop, -loop, uh, joins together like this, we get glycogen. So we've, we've got rid of the glucose. There's no glucose there anymore, but there is glycogen, all right? So we've lowered or reduced glucose. All right, let's see this in practice. So first off, person eats, um, and so blood's absorbed into the bloodstream, and it's cruising around the body. Your gl glucose is cruising around the body, right? Your glucose in your bloodstream is moving around. Well, what's going to happen is the pancreas is going to detect this, right? That's a lot of glucose. Better let the liver know. So it's going to send a signal to the liver. Now, if you remember from the last slide, it is going to release a hormone known as insulin okay so it makes and releases insulin which will then travel through the blood just like the glucose until it gets to the liver right and the liver is going to detect this insulin because it has receptors for insulin and it's going to go oh insulin i need to make glucose sorry glycogen so it's going to absorb all those glucose molecules make the glycogen and therefore as you can see the glucose in the blood has fallen and you need to know this process so please re-watch this animation and there's also a separate video on this one that you can look through again to try and make sure you've got those five steps down. All right. Okay. So what about reproductive hormones now? In females, you've got the major reproductive hormone, which is estrogen. And that leads to development of secondary sex characteristics such as breast development, growth of hips, uh, growth of pubic hair, underarm hair, um, all of these things, uh, increases in body fat. And it also instigates or starts the, the menstrual cycle. Okay, so this is getting your period once a month. It initiates that sort of fertility cycle there. Uh, in males, they have a, a male hormone, is a hormone called testosterone. It also 
also leads to development of secondary sex characteristics in males, which include testes and penis getting larger, increased muscle development, uh, hair growth on the chest, face, armpits, pubic region, um, enlargement of the pharynx um, or the throat, which is killing me right now, guys, um, which usually leads to their voice breaking or a deeper voice. Uh, and it also initiates sperm production or spermatogenesis and, and ejaculation, um, which means that actually a fluid comes out of the penis during uh, orgasm. And this is literally the two hormones that we need to know. Female hormone, male hormone, big major ones just there, okay? So this is all about reproduction, but what if you don't want this situation? If you as an individual don't wanna be these poor, exhausted parents in the background, well then you need to use contraception, okay? And this is sort of the last part of the unit to go through in terms of what contraception is and how it works to stop you having children, okay? And it's really important to understand um, because most people will in some way um, practice sex throughout their lives. So here we go. Um, first, what is, but first, before we understand contraception, let's understand what fertilization is. And so we've got an egg just here, which has come across on the right. Fertilization is actually actually when a sperm meets an egg. So this egg came out of the ovaries during a process known as ovulation, which is when an egg is released. And here comes our friend, the sperm. Now the sperm says, oh, I have just been ejaculated. And look, it's an egg, right? And so when the, when the sperm is released into the female, um, it will actually effectively swim towards the egg. If it gets inside the egg, what you actually get is you get fertilization. So this process of the sperm combining with an egg is what actually makes the baby, that, that baby, or effectively that fertilized egg will implant into the uterus, which will grow over the course of nine months into a baby until you give birth, right? And this is the process of fertilization. Um, and so it's an important process to understand in order to understand contraception, because it's about stopping this. If we can stop fertilization, we can stop you getting pregnant. So let's look at this first method, which is actually barrier methods. So contraception. So let's put a barrier effectively around the penis through th something like a condom. All right. And here we go. So we've got a situation. We've got the egg there. They've just had sex and we've got ejaculation. And so here comes the sperm and he goes, I've been ejaculated. Ooh, an egg, right? And he's going to try and get to this egg, but he can't because something is in the way, can't get there, bro. And so this barrier method acts as a physical barrier to stop the sperm reaching the egg and therefore you can't get pregnant, okay? Um, and the most common example of this is condoms. So barrier methods such as a condom prevent the sperm from reaching an egg. This is probably the most commonly used barrier method that you'll see. Uh, benefits of condom as well is that it does also help protect against uh, STIs or sexually transmitted infections. It's not perfect, but it does. Um, probably one of the biggest problems is people sometimes or often make mistakes putting them on, which means they're not necessarily as effective as they could be. Um, so it's the second method of contraception that you most commonly are asked about, and that's actually hormonal methods of contraception. Um, and so what this situation is, is effectively what we've got here. The sperm comes along, you've just had sex, all right? Mm, where's that egg? Is it further up the fallopian tube? And so he goes, he goes, has a look, all right? No egg, and there's literally no egg present in the female because what the hormonal through the pill, what's happened is the individual or the, the female has been taking the pill, which means that they haven't ovulated. They haven't actually released an egg. And if no egg is released, you can't get pregnant, okay? Which is the basis for a lot of these hormonal methods of contraception. And so you can't get fertilization and you can't get pregnant, okay? The most common example is the pill, okay? So the hormonal methods such as the pill tend to stop the woman from ovulating or releasing an egg, which means you can't get pregnant even if you have unprotected sex. However, if you're on the pill and you are not using a barrier method such as a condom, you still can get transmission of things, sexually transmitted, transmitted infections, um, which isn't necessarily ideal. Okay, So often people tend to use both, the pill and condoms, depending on what they are doing and based on their decisions. Oh, all right. Well, we made it, guys. We made it. That is all of Paper 2 Biology at a foundation AQA GCSE level. I really hope this helped. Uh, of course, please remember to like and subscribe. Uh, and J&E Tri Science is obviously the channel. All right, guys. Thank you very much. I hope you, I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope it helped. Have a good one, and good luck, guys.